presentation that I will be delivering to you today is entitled Management of Mood and Cognition. There are many elements included in this theme, but since I have to deal with the uh, top level or high level information, I'd like to focus a little bit more on things that may be useful for you uh, on your day to day uh, management of your uh, moods and cognitive functions. So let's go ahead with the presentation. I think many of you either have completed your cancer treatment or are in the middle of the treatment. The psychosocial issues that you can think about, you can think of it as a journey in three steps. First of all, the most Im the difficult time for you might have been at the point of diagnosis and trying to adapt to all of the treatments. Of course, on each individual cases, there may be some differences, but this a uh, treatment period that lasts about a year, the fact that you are a cancer patient, you become a little bit more accustomed to that, and you are adjusting physically and emotionally during this period to the treatment that is given to you. After the treatment has been concluded, the burden of the treatment may have lessened, but at the same time, you may suffer from uh, concerns and fears about recurrence. And if you go on to the uh, hormone therapy, there may be some impacts that you receive from that process as well. So post-diagnosis, what level of anxiety and depression do people feel? You may be curious to learn about this. The most difficult period, according to the results of many surveys, is actually at the beginning of the diagnosis stage. So this is looking at depression and anxiety uh, together. We see that in the beginning stages, uh, the level of uh, patients who are experiencing depression and anxiety is very high, and it becomes better over time. If you look in the details uh, on an individual level, everything ha may differ. But in average, we can say that about 40% of patients ha can maintain, let's say, depression-free type of periods. But some people may have had severe depression in the beginning, but things got better with time. Or some people may have started with a certain level of depression, which is actually persistent throughout the period. And in some cases, uh, it actually increases. The level of de uh, depression increases over time. That is to say, in the beginning of diagnosis and the beginning of treatment, things seemed OK. And then afterwards, fear and anxiety has grown about recurrence. So it really depends on a case-by-case -case situation. Because this is related to mood and emotions, uh, the fact that I have cancer, the fact that I'm doing a treatment right now to combat cancer, um, there are many elements that are actually um, affecting you, and it may differ person to person. For example, there are some uh, individual characteristics to take into consideration. For example, age may be a ma major factor. and whether it was diagnosed or not, if you have previous experience with depression and anxiety, that might also be another factor. And depending on the style of adaptation to situations and uh, how much tolerance you have about stress, all of those things may be an impact factor. Additionally, you can think about the physical related uh, effects. The harder it is physically in terms of pain and trouble with breathing, that will actually cause more difficulties. And on the right-hand side, looking at the psychosocial uh, issues, there may be the pure shock and the trauma of being diagnosed with cancer, but there are many other types of changes that you have to face. For example, family life and your career and changes in your body and the burden that your body feels throughout the treatment process and economic difficulty and lack or uh, let's say deficiency of social support will also have an impact. What kind of symptoms can be categorized here? For example, being uh, quite 
uh, desperate or a difficulty in becoming motivated to do things, being depressed, or inability to control negative feelings such as anger and frustration, and having a pessimistic view of the future or an increase of interpersonal conflicts or becoming more and more isolated, a feeling of becoming useless or a feeling of wanting to die or end your life. And there may be some physical symptoms as well, for example, loss of appetite or difficulty in sleeping. For anxiety-related symptoms, there are uh, physical as well as psychological anxiety symptoms that you can think of. On the whole, anxiety means that tension goes up, so physically you can feel those symptoms as well. There are many physical and bodily symptoms related to anxiety, including um, finding it hard to breathe or finding it hard to relax. There is a high level of tension throughout and high level of concern even for minor detailed things and muscle tension as well as a dryness of the mouth or higher rate of heart rate, pulse, and difficulty in concentration. All those things cannot really be explained during the uh, treatment process as uh, physical symptoms. So for those areas, you have to um, be quite sensitive to identify these correctly. You may be wondering whether I'm suffering from depression or not. A depressed feeling does not really mean depression. This is kind of like the weather. It can be there can be sunshine, but it can also be very cloudy some days. It's the same thing. But if those types of moods continue for a long time, over two weeks, persistently throughout the day, then you can think maybe that you have depression. This is. Um, let's say somewhat of an arbitrary uh, criteria because we said two weeks, but it could be longer, it could be shorter, but if it's persistent, then that would be uh, symptomatic of depression. And there are other types of symptoms that you can see. For example, uh, lowering of energy and loss of appetite or excessive feelings of guilt or criticism for uh, himself or herself, and slowing uh, down of responses and activities and having a high level of anxiety. But nevertheless, you would need to see a specialist and identify whether you really do have depression or not. So what kind of prevention measures or treatment measures can be adopted? There are four main areas I would like to focus on. One is focusing on the body and activities. Secondly is to increase your um, strength in terms of the mind. And the third area, especially during the pandemic era, we see that it is, it is very important to have connection with the outside world and also to give and receive help. Looking at the body first, the body and mind are not separate. Responses coming in from the body can provoke other types of reactions of the mind as well. So psychological area and physical areas are actually connected. Especially there have been many uh, study results that show that close relationship between what is going on in your mind as well as how it impacts your uh, stomach's activity. So understanding your body is very important, especially in terms of mood and uh, your feelings. You need to understand that you don't have to do extensive exercise, but a little bit of physical exercise always helps from that perspective. And healthy diet and regular sleep patterns is also important. And relaxing is very important. What happens when you are anxious? What happens? You tend to tense up. Your muscles become all contracted. Your shoulders rise up high. So you have to forcibly or intentionally try to relax. So before going to bed, 
try to relax your muscles and relax your body. And I mentioned this slightly earlier, but if there are areas that are causing physical pain, then, then you have to proactively respond to that. I'm not saying that you have to take painkillers all the time, but if there are, let's say, side effects coming in from your treatment process that causes a lot of pain, that you may have to resort to some pain management-related treatments. Second is having a stronger mind. I think women fare better um, in many aspects, but uh, I think whether it be physical responses, that is to get a good diet and exercise, um, we don't tend to put a lot of effort into making our minds adapt better in a strong way. First and foremost, you have to be more honest about your own emotions. A lot of the patients say to themselves, well, I have to be strong now. I have to think positively. But that in itself may be a lot of pressure for you. First and foremost, you have to honestly think about what are the feelings that you are feeling. If you feel frustrated, if you feel angry, or if you're anxious about whether your treatment will be successful or not, don't try to cover it up. Don't try to say, no, I can't be weak now. But you have to admit and acknowledge the fact that those are your feelings. And there may be some things that you want to express. And if you can, try to express them. Just as the river flows, as water flows in a natural manner, try to express it, whether it be through conversations with someone who listens well to you, or maybe you can write something or draw a picture or make use of music to express yourself. In terms of these serious illnesses, it is also important that you identify and maintain a certain activity that gives you pleasure. You might think there's nothing that I can enjoy now, but if you look carefully, even in the very difficult period of chemotherapy, there may be some things that give you small pleasures. So try to look for that and maintain it. And on a regular basis, encourage yourself. Think about what you have achieved so far, the things that you have overcome, going through all of the tests and examinations. It's really tough, but the fact that you are able to continue with that, that's something to congratulate yourself for. And finding meaningful things in your life and also prioritizing the things in your life is important as well. The third element I really want to emphasize is to connect with the outside world. Sometimes you may not want to meet anyone or go out, but that's really important. The fact that you are connected to other people, to the rest of society, to the rest of the world, it is very important and it does have an influence on the success of the treatment. So on a regular basis, go out. If you don't want to meet with other people and talk about the disease, then go into nature and make sure all of your senses are fully experiencing what nature can provide you. The fourth element that I want to mention is to receive help and provide help to others. It could be your family, your friends, or experts and specialists. There are experts out there and specialists at your hospital who want to help you. So ask for help. And even if you feel that you can't do anything, there are things that you can do to help someone else. If you have that interest in mind, then you can identify areas where you can help. So this was related to mood, and now moving on to the cognitive functions. Related to cognitive functions, cancer-related cognitive impairment, you've probably heard about this. Many cancer patients actually complain about this. However, in terms of the related research uh, and studies, it's actually quite few in terms of number, and the duration has not been that long. For breast cancer, over 50% of breast cancer patients have been complaining about cognitive impairment. Uh, in English, it's often referred to as cancer brain fog. About 10 to 15% have shown abnormalities in these very uh, objective 
cognitive function tests. This is not only due to chemotherapy alone, but depending on what kind of life or daily life patterns you uh, pursue, this may also have an impact on the cognitive uh, function levels as well. So this will be a major element impacting the long-term quality of life. So we have to take that into consideration as being very important as well. Some of the symptoms of cognitive impairment would be, for example, finding it hard to memorize something new or losing concentration or the ability to focus, not being able to remember the exact terminology or names used for specific things, or being kind of uh, unfocused. So there are areas that of our brain related to our memory and also focus and concentration. If there are specific uh, problem-solving areas uh, that are lacking or slower than before, those would count for some impairment of cognitive functions. There are other elements such as fatigue, depression, PTSD or anxiety, or changes in sleep patterns, or anemia or menopause that have an impact on these types of impairments. This is a meta-analysis that was published in 2012. So what level of cognitive uh, impairments were caused by what kind of uh, symptoms and verbal ability and visuospatial ability tended to show the highest rates related to this, doing an MRI of the brain or other types of examinations, we are able to see these types of areas that are all around our brain that are related to these functions. So we cannot say that it's just one part of our brain that is in charge of this. So, for example, some gray matter may have been, let's say, uh, impaired that caused these types of symptoms to occur. Of course, the cancer itself as well as treatment related to cancer uh, has a great impact on these areas. but. At the time of diagnosis, already cognitive impairment is visible. So the cancer itself may have an impact. And also the surgery, anesthesia, as well as targeted therapy, hormone therapy, immunotherapy may also have an impact, not just chemotherapy. There may be some hereditary or genetic factors to take into consideration as well. APOI4 is something that is related to Alzheimer and dementia, so that's something to uh, look out for in terms of an element of impact. And there are also other types of biological factors such as inflammation or cytokines, as well as changes in the brain vessels. If changes occur in the vessels that allow, uh, for example, uh, treatment-related drugs that go into the area where it actually shouldn't, then that will also create some problems in terms of cognitive function as well. So we have seen also in anthropological factors the level of education and uh, cognitive functions prior to cancer diagnosis and age. All of these areas are also elements to take into consideration as well as comorbidities as well. CV-related diseases and diabetes also tend to be related. So those would be the negative points or um, things that could add to the risk factor. Many patients are worried that it may lead to dementia. However, dementia that, well, there are many types of dementia uh, diseases, but Alzheimer is a different disease altogether from the cognitive uh, problems that may occur due to cancer. 
So cancer-related um, cognitive disorders are completely different in nature from Alzheimer. What's very interesting is that these two have a reverse um, relationship because there are many studies that show that among cancer patients, the prevalence of dementia is low. And for dementia patients, the prevalence of cancer patients is low. So for treatment and prevention, first of all, uh, you have to be aware of making your body and physical energy levels very dynamic and try to actively improve feelings of anxiety, depression, and fatigue, and make full use of your brain functions. This is something that we should all try to do and promote, but um, for cancer patients, it's something that you want to focus more on. For example, continue learning, read books, uh, try to do small puzzle games or, for example, simple things to memorize. Um, and you could, for example, go to clubs that teach songs and memorize the lines of the songs and things like that. Um, so that actually promotes uh, functionality of the brain. And try to avoid multitasking. Focus on one thing at a time. And there are many things that you can do to promote memory and um, activate your senses. So, for example, uh, if there are things that you need to memorize, maybe say it out loud or write it down or take a picture of it, um, register an alarm on your phone or use timers in order to make sure that you do not forget. And when you're consulting an expert or a specialist, after chemotherapy, um, not everybody suffers from cognitive uh, deterioration. So you should get a specific testing done in order to find out if it is indeed something that is visible. Right now, we do not have strong scientific evidence that um, medical uh, medication will help with this type of uh, problem. So. Basically, mood-related issues is something that is very commonly seen with breast cancer patients. And there are many elements related to this, not just the cancer itself and the treatment, but also psychosocial issues as well. So you have to take into consideration all of those multiple aspects of reasons and causes and take care of your moods. For cognitive issues, I mentioned earlier that there's already 10 to 15 percent that has has been identified with cognitive disorders after cancer treatment. So make sure that you keep those in mind. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.